we're getting some questions. Please keep these coming. Um, Owen's asking, interesting one here. Do we have experience in combining uh, synchronous and asynchronous methods? So, for example, a pre-recorded session, but with the opportunity to have live interaction or polling at points. So, Dario, I think the kind of course that we're proposing mm. as part of the KT comes to mind. Um, mm. I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Yeah, one. we we. Yeah, we haven't done it yet, uh, but we we we've proposed it for for one uh, so online brief uh, short course, which would uh, include both synchronous uh, sessions uh, with tutors and asynchronous assign uh, ass, uh, assignments and uh, homework, and uh, possibly also additional screencasts for watching between the session. Uh, that's a different kind of uh, learning program which we haven't built, delivered yet, but we are constantly thinking of the ways how to expand uh, our offer uh, and and uh, fine tune it with with the learning content and the learner's needs for that particular uh, circumstance or situation. Yeah, I mean another combination is obvious one uh, having a se session recorded and then provided it as a recording, which is then combining synchronous and asynchronous, which is a not really a rocket science, but <laughs> It's still kind of useful thing. I know there are people with are experimenting with that blend that you're talking about is blended learning. And I know that um, Cochrane UK, I know some colleagues there are joining us today. Um, and also Cochrane Sweden have experimented with um, asking people to complete the Cochrane interactive learning modules and then delivering workshops to follow those up. Now I know those are, some of that's been taking place face to face, but current circumstances has then pu pushed that online. So what was originally attended for people to take some asynchronous learning, those online learning modules, and then attend some face to face learning has now gone from asynchronous learning on those online learning modules into synchronous vir virtual workshops. Um, and I think there's been some success with that. Um, so there's lots of different ways that these things can be matched together. I think that's one of the things that Dario and I were trying to get people thinking about at the beginning is who who is it you want to reach and what learning do they need to do and what what's good what do webinars work well for what do virtual workshops work well for or where do you may, where may you need different tools I think I think actually this this uh, KT that KT workshop dissemination checklist is something new is is being developed in Cochrane uh, and and there was two day workshop uh, prepared, but due to circumstances, it wasn't delivered. So the subject matter experts came to us and said, well, what we can do about that online in, in a virtual environment? So we had a look at that session and we said, okay, these were two day workshop face to face. And if you want to turn it into an online, it needs to be something quite different. And we proposed something that would run for five weeks uh, with uh, one live session each week with the homework and, and other stuff between this live session. So it's a different thing, but it's important to note how, how the same content can be uh, basically transformed based on the, on, on the circumstances, needs, and, uh, and the capacities that you have at the moment. So a question here from uh, Kira. Do you have recommendations for software which provides closed captioning or subtitles for persons with additional support needs? Um, I'm not aware of a, a, a platform th that runs webinars or runs virtual workshops that provides that, but I'd be really happy to be corrected on that and investigate it. Dario, well, I don't know whether you know any... More. Well, go to go to meeting does provide transcripts of the recordings that I know. That's post. But that's the a event, bit of a isn't different it? thing. That's that's yeah. not something that that's during the session. So I don't think. I mean, I haven't heard about that one. No, um, but I think that's something that we'd be interested in pursuing. So um, leave that with us. I think that's something for, for us to perhaps look into in a bit more detail. If that, if indeed that's out there. Um, Sam, hi Sam. I can see the advantage of go-to meeting for the sorts of sessions I run, so small and informal um, with interactions. But I really miss the option of starting the session with a 
um, with the presenter and adding the attendees when you're ready. So just for everybody's benefit, that's how GoToWebinar works. Dario and I are able to meet on the platform before we start the session itself and get ourselves ready before we open the broadcast to all of you who are registered and waiting to attend. Is there a workaround in these in GoToMeeting or would another tool such as Zoom be the right tool? Zoom does that. Zoom is better. Zoom yeah. is better. So Zoom has a waiting room function. So what you can do is as organizers, um, if you're a license holder, you can kind of organize it so that the people who are your co-presenters join you on the platform and anybody else who is signing in is put into a waiting room. And when you're ready to start, you can basically admit them from the waiting room. So Zoom is the platform to do that with. Um, Connie, with uh, two to three days face-to-face -face workshops, how do you translate them into a virtual workshop? Any advice or made experiences? Certainly not a virtual workshop, I would say. Uh, Dario? Well, that, that's what I was exactly what I was talking about with the dissemination checklist workshop. It's not something that we would ever recommend to, to run two-day workshop six hours a day. I mean, there are virtual conferences and I've attended one, uh, which is really actually two days of six or more hours of live program. That's quite quite intensive, exhausting. And uh, I don't think it really uh, um, uh, uses the full benefit of virtual environment because you can't you can put seven presentations one after the another and spend six hours watching them. But that's not really what you want. You want people to to do something, to interact with with some material, and you need to give them a chance and time for that. So we, I would always recommend, okay, spread it throughout some time, some weeks perhaps, and give people chance to to do some home homework, get back to you as tutors, provide them feedback before the next session, or you can even discuss during the next session. All of that, of course, requires much more commitment from the presenter or for, from the subject matter experts or facilitators, because usually people land somewhere, spend two days presenting, and they're done, whereas this is more like a short course that you need to commit to for a couple of weeks or more even. So, uh, But if you want to benefit really from, from that kind of content, then you need to commit to that. You may start to see a theme coming through this, folks. This is this is one of the things that the present the pre presentations. We're, we're very lucky. We have uh, very many very high quality presenters who join us on the sessions that we run, um, and their material is excellent. It's still the challenge is to how you make that interactive, how you work with people to make them do exercises and turn that from a presentation into learning. Um, that's that's something that we're constantly working with, and it needs work it's, it's there's no way around that um nikita how much asynchronous viewing do you get relative to synchronous and do you promote previous webinars um i can maybe take that dario so yes we do so we see the learning live program from the when we designed it um four years ago we always saw that we would run the session and record it edit it into smaller pieces learning pieces sort of pieces of learning and share that um, with our idea, the idea being that that would then turn it into a mini learning resource. Um, and we do get a lot of views of that. As Dario said, we're kind of approaching the 200,000 mark of views of our webinars. And and some we have some front runners in that. So Covidence is one, Grade, and lots of the method sessions get a lot of follow up. Um, they're all in our archive. So we've, we've got a big archive of them, but we also use them within learning resources themselves. So where we're running some stuff for, K, for online translation at the moment, they'll not just be the standalone webinars, but we'll integrate them into the knowledge translation collection that's part of the Cochrane Training website. So we see our webinars as having a life outside of the webinar itself. The idea is that it gives us learning material that we can embed in the Cochrane Training website as well. Don't do with everything, but we try to do it um, where we can. Dario, anything to add? Do to you remember? That? Yeah, well, for example, do, do you know how, how many people we have a rough, kind of rough number of, about users of interactive learning modules? Remember? Interactive learning, I think our, our users is something like well, 25,000, something like 25, that. 25,000. Individual users, I can't okay. remember exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it could be 25,000 for our interactive learning modules, which is asynchronous learning 
developed for that purpose, 25, and then 200,000 views. Of course, viewing a webinar recording can be quite different in type of engagement than actually engaging with online learning module, but that's kind of a relative figure one to another. Mm -hmm. What we, we think, the, 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 what, I guess the, 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 the short answer to this is that we see both of those things working together. We, try, we see them as part of the same package. And that also helps us with international audience. So our audience is international. So not everybody can attend the webinar when we run it. So if we have an asynchronous version that can still has a life three or four years later, then that learning, you know, that's a really good return on investment for running the webinar. Okay, next uh, question. Uh, yeah. Ideally, on a synchronous event, would you need moderator, presenter, and tech support person? Uh, I say that that's that's ideal that you would have. I mean, if you can get it, so that each of them can focus on these their respective talks. But sometimes, I mean, especially if you're more and more experienced or you know skilled, you can do both moderation and and tech support. Okay, Chris, another question from Nikita. Uh, are you considering subtitling for online training? We're looking into this and how to resource it. So we subtitle our um, our, uh, our videos. Uh, so uh, we don't subtitle all of the videos that are made available on uh, from the webinars. Uh, there is they're put on YouTube. That's how you're accessing them when you see them on our website, and and that has an automated subtitle. We just we we're not able to subtitle absolutely everything, although the community can if they want to add, to, add subtitles and help us with that. Where they're within our modules, we do add subtitles in, and we also have transcripts. So that's not a piece of software. Um, we do that. We do that because we host our videos on our YouTube channel. So YouTube is worth looking at for helping you to do subtitling where it's video content. Mm. Olabisi says, I think the quality of the internet connectivity that is available in the setting may also play a role in determining what method of learning to adopt. Well, in a way, all of this that we talked today is dependent on the fact on the on the internet. So without the internet, uh, it's very difficult to think of online virtual learning. So that's basically a prerequisite. Um, yeah. So with our online learning modules, we, we try to as much as we can to make them light so that, that they don't, 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 you know, uh, break the connection or, or uh, for, for those who don't have a broadband or whatever. But yeah, nowadays it's really difficult uh, without proper internet connection. Okay. Chris, any other questions that you there's a, there's a few other questions. What I'd suggest we've got a couple of minutes left, and I quite like to wrap up at this point. Um, but Dario and I are going to stay online for another few minutes after I've wrapped up to answer these few more remaining questions, or if anybody's got any others. So feel free to stay online, everyone. Let me just wrap up, Dario. Could you just move to the next slide for me, please? Mm, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's that's the one. Great. Thank you. So this is just to let you know what's going to happen following the session. So thanks everybody for joining us. It's been um, really great, and thank you for all your interest um, with the questions that you've posed. Uh, we're going to follow this up with an evaluation that's going to come out to you all tomorrow in the form of a brief survey about the about the uh, webinar, and we're really interested to hear from you on what else will be helpful. So as I said, we see this as uh, this is a, an ongoing task for us to do to support the community and, and, and skill up the community in how they you might organize webinars. But you may have other needs. So it might be that you're interested in, um, you may need more support on the platforms, for example, and making choices about those, or you may feel in need of moderation or presentation skills or any of those kinds of things. So let us know what your needs are, and we'll do our best to be responsive to them. Um, we're going to share this webinar that it's recorded, so we'll edit it and put it up on our website shortly afterwards. Um, this slide set as well, we'll put that up. And we'll also include, Dario's put together some good practice tips um, based in part on what we've gone over today, but that's a bit more extended. So look out for that. We'll link to that through to that from um, this, this sort of mini resource that we'll build from this webinar. And we'll also include that planning template that Dario talked about um, for a virtual workshop. So you can see how we've 
put together a sort of comprehensive plan and overview of how a virtual workshop might work. And that might give you some indication of, of our approach to that. Um, feel free to contact us. So that's the survey is a great way for you to contact us, but do contact us outside of that if you wish. We're on uh, Twitter at Cochrane Train, or there's an email um, that you can, uh, you can um, email us directly. So we'll formally close the webinar there. For those of you who want to drop off at this point, please do so. Dario and I will go back to the questions and we'll answer those few remaining questions for the next sort of 10, 15 minutes or so for anybody who wants to hang around, but no pressure. Um, if people want to go, we're on the hour, thanks. Okay. Let's... Okay. Uh, okay. So a few people I think to... mentioned about Zoom. Uh, so this is coming back. Uh, these must have been questions that came in when we were talking about the captioning. Um, mm -hmm. So Zoom has got a feature. Some people are pointing out that Zoom has got a feature to do that. Um, thank you. Uh, someone else said Meet and from MS Google Teams Docs. Also. And uh, yeah, Microsoft Meet also does transcriptions for recorded sessions. So it seems like transcriptions, automated transcriptions of sessions are quite reasonably easy to come across, which I think we're aware of. I think the question that in part is is a help, but I think the question might have been about as much about how people might, if they, if they need live transcriptions during a live session so they can participate, how that might work. Um, and the answer, of, yeah, as I've said, I'm not sure whether we, I, I know the answer to that, um, but I'd certainly be interested if, um, if there was something that helped with that. So Ursula, I have a, Ursula has a question yeah, about has the model of a recorded main presentation followed by a discussion led by different facilitators been used to allow a team of staff to deliver iterations of small group webinars? Um, we haven't tried it yet. I mean, there's no reason why we wouldn't uh, if there's a need or a specific situation or a content that would require that. It's, it relates also with the availability of subject matter experts, I guess. I mean, what you can have, for example, is if you have a really kind of big expert and uh, their availability, availability is limited, you could record a screencast with them and then ask everyone, learners, to to watch it previous to the session, and then you run the session with perhaps, you know, a different group of, of subject matter experts. The problem with that is always the the um, how to call that the the the, the uh, compliance, uh, whether people will actually that watch that before they come there. And the problem is that if you have 30% of people who haven't watched it and 70% of people who did or any other combination of percentages, then you are in a, in a bit of a difficult situation because some people are confused, people, some people can't follow, then you have to explain or uh, you know, uh, describe for them in more detail, whereas others are, you know, have watched and, and they want to get right into the exercise or something. So it is a bit of a risk, I think. So we, that's one of the reasons why we haven't tried it, but I guess that's something that we, we, we can explore if needed. There, there is another scenario, which is where you might have somebody so, who is sort of time poor, who might deliver a, a sort of virtual presentation, record a virtual screencast, which you might show live during a webinar and then follow that up with some form of facilitated discussion. So you might have a presenter who only needs to present that once as a recording. They don't need to set, attend because you have facilitators who can then run any number of sessions where that you can have a follow-up discussion. I've not, I don't, we've not found ourselves in that circumstance where that's necessary, but that's just, that's another way that you could approach it. Yeah. Yeah. The reason is what, because we, we are, we usually don't run uh, many repeated sessions. Now, as we are taking up more virtual workshops, that might become a scenario so so that might be an option actually probably something that we would want to have if we want to rerun the virtual workshops for a larger number of audiences eventually so uh amna is is content is uh, come from libya where uh they mentioned they have connection issues um uh, electricity and connection issues, which, yeah, that's something that we, again, we we try to support where we can. 
Um, I can talk a little bit about the platforms and how solid they are and access. Um, go, the good thing about GoTo platform and Zoom platform is it adapts to local um, uh, uh, bandwidth, so but it's not infallible. Um, so we know that some people have access issues, that obviously beyond our control as organizers, but um, we try to keep bandwidth demands to a minimum. Um, YouTube, again, we use YouTube specifically because it reaches our sort of post webinar videos reach a much larger audience. And also because YouTube um, adapts to the local bandwidth. So if you're in a sort of low bandwidth area, then uh, you can watch those videos at a sort of lower quality. So it gets them out. We don't have to manage that and provide different quality videos. That's done in an automated way through YouTube. It's not infallible because YouTube isn't available in every country around the world. But as things stand, that's our best solution. Those are some. So so recording and sharing the webinars is 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 the, probably the best way that we can get to help contribute people who struggle to attend them live. I think we have just another one question or a comment. Um, Emma says, I organized the stakeholder group uh, from priority setting. In hindsight, we should have done some asynchronous training prior to the webinar and made that a more interactive discussion. Can CRGs contact you to help us design webinars for priority setting? And would you consider putting together a package of learning that CRGs could use for this? What do you think, Chris? Well, absolutely. I mean, we're happy to offer advice. That's um, that's something that we can help with. And just bring out that question. So, I think we'd have to. Yeah, I mean, we can. This is this is part of what we're doing here, Emma. I think if you're still online, is is thinking about ways that we can support the community um, to to run these kinds of events for itself. Um, so we can offer advice um, that sort of is kind of continued advice based on this webinar. We can have a specific conversation with you about what you want to do and how you might go about putting it together and what that might mean from a resourcing perspective. So how much work is involved in that, how you approach it, who you need to be involved, how we might get involved and the extent to which we can support it and, and where else you get support from. So the the package of learning, um, I think if you, that would depend on the option that you took. So we've run, if there's more than one piece of, if there's more than one sort of webinar, for example, or screencast or something like that, that gets recorded, then we can pull that together as a package. Um, if it's something a bit more detailed that needs more, um, uh, more specific work or more specific development, then we'd have to we'd have to talk about what that would require and when we could schedule it in. I don't know, Dario, have you got anything to add to that? No, no, no. I think it's just to to I guess perhaps to finish with with the to emphasize that all this the whole the point of this webinar was to uh, I guess raise the awareness of the abilities uh, and opportunities that that the community can uh, take uh, in running their own learning and, and, and training uh, online. And we, we've shared our uh, experiences and we can provide, as we said, some advice. If you have some specific programs that you want to run or improve, you can always contact us. Uh, we are happy to, 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 to provide advice or share our experience always. And uh, um, we would be definitely happy that if we, if we see that good quality online learning is being de delivered across the Cochrane community by different Cochrane groups and not only by our team. Isn't it right, Chris? I, 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 I think you would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's that's, that's, what we're, that's where we'd like to be headed. Um, okay, that's great. Thank you, everybody. That I think that's all of the questions that they've come in. Thank you, everybody, for your supportive comments as well. Thanks to the 47 of you who've stayed on to the to the, the, the very Very end to, to, to hear those final questions really appreciate it so we'll as i say valuation coming out tomorrow please take some time to let us know what's useful to you we'll do our best to respond to that um and we'll share the materials from this webinar probably shortly after we've had a chance to look at your comments in the next week or so but uh, we'll leave it there thanks very much everybody thanks everyone bye bye